Society. My name is Pepper Crutcher. To introduce our moderator today, who will introduce the panelists, our moderator is Judge Chad Radler of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. He's a Michigan undergraduate and law degree holder, and we will avoid the um, sign stealing jokes at this point. Um, he was a clerk on the Sixth Circuit to Judge Alan Norris. He was in the Columbus, Ohio office of Jones Day for 10 years as a partner in the appellate practice group. He was acting assistant attorney general for the Civil Division of the United States Department of Justice from 27 to 2019. In March of 2019, he was confirmed as a circuit judge and he resides in Columbus, Ohio. Judge Radler. Pepper, thank you very much. Uh, so living in Columbus, Ohio, as I do, I'm, I'm, um, Michigan jokes are not uncommon, uh, so it would not have, uh, would not have minded. But good morning, everyone. Welcome to our panel discussion. Uh, let me say thank you to the Federal Society for inviting me and putting together this panel. Uh, you know, it's hard to find these days uh, organizations that are willing to put on programs that are not only thoughtful but also uh, diverse in terms of viewpoints. I think the Federal Society is probably... Uh, first and foremost in that category, and so we're all really fortunate to have had a week-long uh, discussion uh, from diverse viewpoints, and that will be also true this morning, I'm quite confident, and so I think you're in store for a real treat. Uh, the one downside about the Federal Society Convention, which is one of my favorite weeks of the year, uh, is that between, you know, two or three days out in the hallway at the Mayflower Hotel where you're screaming to try to talk to one another, uh, having dinner with 2,400 of your closest friends, or you can barely hear the person next to you, uh, it can challenge your vocal cords. Uh, mine are hanging in there, uh, but I think by a thread. So uh, I will do my best this morning to make it through uh, the program, but it's been a great week and great to see so many of you. Uh, so our discussion this morning is about labor law and some current um, initiatives by the National Labor Relations Board. And we just have two wonderful speakers to help us flesh out those issues. So let me introduce them. Uh, first, uh, closest to me is Craig Becker. Craig is the general counsel to the AFL-CIO. Before assuming that position, he was a member of the National Labor Relations Board, having been appointed by President Obama in March 2010 and serving until January 2012. Before joining the board, Craig served as associate general counsel to both the SEIU and the AFL-CIO. After law school, he clerked on the Eighth Circuit, and he then became a partner in the Washington, D.C. firm that was counsel to the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. Craig was a professor of law at the UCLA School of Law and has also taught at Yale, University of Chicago, and Georgetown Law School. He's published numerous articles on labor and employment law and scholarly journals, as well as in the popular press, and he's argued labor and employment cases in virtually every federal court of appeals and in the Supreme Court. And he's a graduate of Yale Law School. On the far end of the table is Philip Miscamara. Uh, Ms. Philip Miscamara is a partner at Morgan Lewis and leads the firm's NLRB special appeals practice. His practice focuses on labor management relations, business acquisitions and restructuring, and employment litigation. He is also a senior fellow at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School and the Wharton Center for Human Resources. He is the former chairman of the NLRB he was appointed to the board initially by President Obama in April 2013, and he's confirmed by voice vote. That sounds awfully nice. Um, uh, later that year, and he served until December 2017. In 2017, he was named chairman of the board by President Donald Trump. And he currently serves, uh, as, is currently serving a six-year term on the USMCA Independent Mexico Labor Export Board created pursuant to the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, which is the successor to NAFTA. Uh, he's the author and co-author of several books involving labor law issues. He's testified in front of Congress on labor and employment law matters, and he's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Law School. So I think we've agreed to give each of you uh, sort of some opening comments, and then I'll have some questions, and of course, as is tradition, we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, Craig, I think you're gonna start us off with sort of a history of uh, where we are and how we got here. Uh, I feel like I'm in a law school class with no one wanting to sit in the front, but uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Judge, and thank you to the Federalist Society uh, for inviting me into the lion's den. Uh, so at the NLRB, where Phil and I both serve, there's a quaint tradition called the personal footnote, uh, 
So this is where a member uh, either doesn't want to write a full dissent or has already dissented and want to, wants to continue their, uh, their opposition to prevailing doctrine. So I just want to pause to drop a personal footnote as to the title of today's program, uh, Horror on Half Street. Uh, continuing on that theme, uh, when Phil was chairman, or just after he became chairman, a host of important decisions issued uh, reversing important decisions of the Obama board. And within the labor movement, uh, we lovingly called it the Miscamara Massacre. So I, I think Phil probably felt about that title the same way I do about the title of today's uh, program. I, I knew that was coming. <laughs> okay, now to the point. Uh, so I want to do uh, three things. Uh, one, I, I do want to give you a little bit of history, just background of the, of the changes or the potential changes that we're about to talk about. Uh, then I want to talk about those changes, the position of the general counsel on captive audience, so-called captive audience meetings, and some state laws that have been passed concerning captive audience meetings more broadly. Uh, and then I want to make an argument intended to convince you that uh, you should support those changes. So first, some history. Uh, prior to the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, the NLRB held that employers' participation in campaigns before union elections was unlawful. Uh, the board reasoned that uh, it was improper for the employer, who was neither a candidate nor a voter, to attempt to influence the choice of employees of who would sit across the table from the employer in collective bargaining. Uh, the board reasoned, quote, election is not a contest between a labor organization and the employer of the employees being polled, and participation by the employer in a pre-election campaign as if we were a contestant is an interference with the employee's right to bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing. And of course, it wasn't simply that the employer was not a voter uh, or a candidate. Uh, it was also uh, that, quote, the relationship existing between the author of the utterances, i.e. the employer, and the employees, uh, uh, attained a force stronger than their intrinsic connotation and beyond that of persuasion, amounting to illegal coercion, i.e., the employer would exert undue influence because of its economic authority over the employees. So in other words, the board held employees' statutory right to choose their bargaining representative free from employer interference, imposed a correlative duty on the employer to maintain complete neutrality with respect to an election. And the Supreme Court, interestingly, initially, uh, endorse that notion, that underlying notion. The court held slight suggestions of employer preference have a telling effect upon men who know the consequences of incurring their employer's strong displeasure. But the court soon uh, departed from that understanding and made clear that the board's doctrine was untenable under the First Amendment. First, in a case involving a Texas law which actually restrained union speech, requiring union organizers to register, uh, the court struck down the law, but Justice Jackson in a concurrence made clear that the First Amendment extended not only to unions, uh, but to employers. Justice Jackson wrote, labor is free to turn its publicity on any labor oppression. The employer, too, should be free to answer. He expressly criticized the earlier rulings by both the board and the Supreme Court that denied employer the right to speak freely in a union election campaign writing, quote, free speech on both sides of the labor relations is to me a constitutional and useful right. Congress in 1947, just after these Supreme Court decisions, codified that right uh, in the Taft-Hartley Act, so-called free speech proviso, what we now refer to as Section 8C of the Act, which we'll be talking about at some length, I believe. And let me quote it in full. So the so-called free speech proviso said, uh, provides, quote, the expression of any views, arguments, or opinion, or the dissemination thereof, whether in written, printed, graphic, or visual form, shall not constitute or be evidence of an unfair labor practice under any of the provisions of this subchapter if such expression contains no threat of reprisal or force or promise of benefit. So critical to the argument now being made by the general counsel, as I'll lay out more later, uh, is the limit uh, of the protection in Section 8C. That is, quote, if such expression contains no threat of reprisal, unquote. Because such a threat is, of course, inherent in a captive audience uh, meeting. Captive audience meeting means employees are required to attend on pain of discipline up to discharge. That is a threat. If you don't attend, you'll be disciplined. Now, uh, nevertheless, 
despite that logic, immediately after Taft-Hartley, the board held that the proviso not, uh, not only protected employer free speech, but protected the compulsion inherent in captive audience meetings. Uh, that decision uh, had reasoning, which is confined to two sentences. And I'll read them for you. Quote, the language of Section 8C of the amended act and its legislative history makes it clear that the doctrine of the Clark Brothers case no longer exists as a basis for finding unfair labor practices in circumstances such as the record discloses. Even assuming that the respondent required its employees to attend and listen to the speeches, we conclude that it did not inherently violate the act. That is the sum total of the reasoning. Of course, the language of 8C says no such thing. Uh, that should be the end of the inquiry. As for the reference to the discussion of Clark Brothers in the legislative history, uh, Phil and I can give you an extensive discourse on the legislative history, probably from memory in Phil's case, um, in the question and answer session. But for now, suffice it to say that that's a reference to a sentence in the Senate report on the Taft-Hartley Act, which did disapprove the Clark Brothers case. But the Clark Brothers case was a case which held that any speech by the employer in the workplace during the workday was unlawful. So the rejection was of the restriction on employer speech generally, not on the compulsion inherent in a captive audience meeting. Now, indeed, if you want an exhaustive catalog of the legislative history of Section 8C, uh, which Phil, I'm sure, will give you, but I commend to you Phil's testimony from the House Ed and Labor Committee hearings where you've got, in true law review fashion, two pages where two-thirds of which are covered by footnote, uh, which is in a font too small to read, uh, which recount in great detail the legislative history of 8C. And if you look at all those references, you'll find payon after payon to the First Amendment. But you'll look in vain for anything in the legislative history which says free speech includes the right to compel listening. It's not there. <coughs> to the contrary, the legislative history makes crystal clear that 8C was intended to codify the First Amendment. And we all know that the First Amendment, the Supreme Court has construed time and time again to allow protection of captive audiences in different contexts. Subsequent board decisions simply follow the original decision, no further reasoning. And yet stripped to its essence, the board precedence permits the employer to force employees to listen on pain of discipline, to discipline employees who decline to attend or politely leave such meetings, and even to require employees to remain silent during those meetings and to discipline employees who respectfully disagree. I believe, along with the general counsel, that that board, original board decision is grievously wrong. It's, just, it's inconsistent with the language of 8C and with the fundamental purpose of the act, which was to allow free choice of employees free of employer coercion. It has nothing to do with employer free speech. So what's happening now? The general counsel is arguing to the board that they should reverse that 1948 decision and hold captive audience meetings are unlawful. Her argument is simple, and I'll quote it. Those meetings inherently involve an unlawful threat that employees will be disciplined or suffer other reprisals if they exercise their protected right not to listen to such speech. Employees clearly have a right to receive information about, un about unions from others, both unions and employers, and correspondingly they have the right to decline to receive information. After all, she argues, the Supreme Court has stated, quote, private citizens have always retained the power to decide for themselves what they wish to read and within limits what oral messages they want to consider. That issue is now pending before the board. At the same time, four states, California, Maine, Minnesota, and New York, have recently passed, and Oregon has had on the books for some time, uh, laws that we call worker freedom laws. And those laws prohibit employers, generally, from requiring employees to attend meetings which cons which concern in which the employer expresses its views or has a third party express its views on politics and religion, with politics being broadly defined to include electoral politics, ballot initiatives, joining a civic organization, including a labor organization. The chamber, represented by Phil and others, has challenged the Connecticut law on labor law preemption and First Amendment grounds. So that's the history, and that's what's happening currently. So um, now I want to convince you why you should support the general counsel's position in those state laws. So first, you're all textualists. The text of this, the 
the free speech proviso in the NLRA clearly does not protect threats. It explicitly doesn't protect threats. And a threat is necessary to create a captive audience meeting. You attend or you be disciplined. You leave and you'll be disciplined. Therefore, captive audience meetings are not protected by the proviso. End of the story. Secondly, you believe, as I certainly do, in religious liberty. And I'm sure you believe that it violates Title VII for an employer to require employees to attend a religious meeting, prayer or otherwise. And that's not a hypothetical possibility. Just last, uh, uh, last summer, the EEOC settled a case against a North Carolina home repair company called Aurora Pro Services. Uh, since at least June of 2020, Aurora had required all its employees to attend daily employer-led Christian prayer meetings. The meetings were conducted by the company owner and included Bible readings, Christian devotionals, and solicitation of prayers requested from employees. Aurora's owner took role before some of the meetings and reprimanded employees who did not attend, etc. cetera. EEO sued and the case was settled. The EEOC alleged, correctly in my view, that this violated Title VII. If you believe the First Amendment extends to permitting employers to compel employees to listen to anti-union speech, you have to believe that Title VII is unconstitutional in that respect. I'm sure you don't, and I don't. Third, you're all originalists, and one of the founders' deepest fears was that propertyless laborers would obtain the franchise and be subject to undue influence from their employers. In fact, many opposed extending the franchise to workers for that reason. Uh, they exposed extending the vote to, quote, mechanics and manufacturers who receive their bread from their employers. Even if they were granted the franchise, Governor Morris argued, quote, propertyless wage earners will not truly be represented because they would sell their vote to the rich who will be able to buy them. In James Madison's words, working men, quote, will become the tools of opulence and ambition. So surely the founders, who were so concerned about the undue influence of employers on those who didn't hold property and thus had to work for a living, would not have believed that the First Amendment extended to allowing employers to require employees to sit and be told how to vote. The same can be said about the second founding. The Reconstruction witnessed a burst of legislation in the South reflecting Republicans' concern that Southern employers were pressuring their employees, including newly freed slaves, to vote in favor of Democrats. And this, too, is not a hypothetical concern. The last several elections have witnessed countless news stories about employers doing exactly that, that is, requiring their employees to sit and listen to the employer tell them how to vote. In 2012, for example, miners at Murray Energy Century Coal Mine in Bellsville, Ohio, reported that they were forced to attend a rally for then-candidate Mitt, Mitt Romney at the mine. The founders clearly did not understand the liberty protected by the First Amendment to encompass employers' ability to coerce employees in this way. Fourth, you believe Governor Ron DeSantis is a smart Harvard-trained lawyer who would certainly not violate employers' First Amendment rights. But right now in the 11th Circuit, uh, right now the 11th Circuit is considering a First Amendment challenge to his, quote, Individual Freedom Act, which among other things bars employers from forcing employees to attend meetings that espouse any one of eight concepts related to race, color, sex, and national origin. One of those concepts that uh, employers can't speak about or can't compel their employees to listen to their speech about is, quote, an individual by virtue of his or her race, color, sex, or national origin bears personal responsibility for and must feel guilt, anguish, or other form of psychological distress because of the actions in which the individual played no part committed in the past by other members of the same race, color, sex, or national origin. So the Florida law being defended by Governor DeSantis in the 11th Circuit prevents employers from compelling their employees to listen to speech about those subjects. Exactly what the state laws do in the states I mentioned and what uh, the general counsel is arguing the board, to the board should be unlawful in the labor context. Governor Santos argues that these laws don't regulate speech but conduct. Quote, what the act does, all it does, is prevent employers from conscripting their employees against their will into the audience as a conditioner of their employment. That's from his brief to the court. Uh, 
The First Amendment, quote, does not protect the ability of employers to use their economic leverage over their workers to force them on pain of losing their jobs or other sanction to attend training sessions advocating such views on questions of race. Interestingly, cite an example from the Supreme Court's fair decision, DeSantis argues, a legislature, for example, can prohibit racial discrimination in hiring without violating the First Amendment, even though so, such a prohibition would require an employer to take down a sign reading white applicants only. And here, the Individual Freedom Act does not even impose that much of a burden on speech. Rather, the act uh, employment provisions are akin not to a prohibition on white applicants only sign, but rather to a prohibition on employers' practice of forcing all employees to look at it. And the governor goes beyond arguing that the law regulates conduct and that's not speech to argue that even if it regulates speech, incidentally, there's a compelling government interest. And what is the compelling governmental interest? Protection of a captive audience. He argues that the Florida law's provisions, quote, liberate an employee from being coerced into attending an instructional event that he cannot practically avoid, at least not without risk to his livelihood. Now, the Florida law is obviously different uh, from what the general counsel is proposing or what the state laws uh, uh, provide in that it, it suppresses speech based on viewpoint. Right? That is different. But if you believe anything that I just quoted from Governor DeSantis's brief, uh, you have to believe that the state laws at issue are not prohibited by the First Amendment uh, and that the general counsel's position is consistent with the First Amendment. Now, as to the state laws, there's obviously a labor law preemption uh, argument, as well as a First Amendment interest. But in the interest of letting Phil have some time to talk, I'm going to leave that for later. Uh, so let me just finish. Uh, I assume, based on what I have to say, that you'll now all be willing to sign a brief uh, opposing Phil's position uh, in Connecticut and arguing that the Connecticut law is lawful uh, and support the general counsel's position. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to Phil. I will, I will just say thank you, uh, Craig. We, we promised a disagreement, and we got a rousing uh, endorsement of the DeSantis administration. So uh, this is going a different direction than I thought. But uh, <laughs> Phil. Yeah, I appreciate Judge Raidler's uh, introduction and also the fact that Craig is uh, speaking uh, with us on this panel today. You know, when I served as chairman or board member on the NLRB, I was constantly reminded of one statement made by John Fanning, who is one of the longest uh, serving NLRB members and former chairman of the board. And uh, John Fanning served on the board four days short of 25 years. He participated in some 25,000 NLRB decisions, and he said, quote, one factor every NLRB case has in common is the presence of at least two people who see things completely differently. Um, so this is not unusual to have divergent views with respect to important issues that are addressed by the National Labor Relations Act. And I think everyone in this room believes, and Craig and I share this view, that the NLRA deals with important issues. So, um, but I think the speech restrictions uh, that Craig supports uh, and which are being pursued by the NLRB general counsel in a number of different cases, I think in my view that they, I think they are contrary to the NLRA. And I think the NLRA cases that are being prosecuted infringe on First Amendment rights. Uh, not only the underlying claims in those cases, but I think the cases themselves infringe on the First Amendment. And um, uh, I want to say at the outset that I have respect for the views that uh, Craig just articulated. I also have respect for the NLRB's current general counsel, Jennifer Abruzzo, uh, and I respect all of the current and former and future members on the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, but in connection with the uh, impermissibility, in my view, of the NLRB General Counsel's speech restrictions on employer discussions in the workplace about union issues or the exercise of NLRA protected rights. I'll make four points. Um, and uh, the first point 
I'll start by saying uh, when I was uh, in my Senate confirmation hearing 10 years ago for the NLRB, I said that if I was confirmed to serve on the board, I would remember that labor law policy originates with Congress, not with members of the National Labor Relations Board. And so when, you know, I think we're all lawyers, uh, at least most of the people here are lawyers, when we talk about a statute's requirements or restrictions, uh, the first place to look is not policy. The first place to look is what does the statute say? And, you know, Craig made reference to Section 8C of the NLRA, but I think it makes sense to unpack it uh, a little bit. So this section in the statute, it says that the expressing of any views, argument, or opinion, not just facts, any views, argument, or opinion, or the de dissemination thereof, shall not constitute or be evidence of an unfair labor practice under any of the provisions of this act. This is not common language that you see in statutes. And it doesn't just relate to making statements that are neutral with respect to objectively describing events. It protects views, argument, or opinion and they won't violate any of the provisions of the act. And there is a proviso, and here's what the proviso says. This section ends with a statement that says, quote, if such expression contains no threat of reprisal or force or promise of benefit. But the word there is, the protection afforded to these expressions are lost if the expressions themselves contain a threat of reprisal or force or promise of benefit. Now, Craig and I agree on a couple of things. One is, if an employer's statement contains a coercive threat or unlawful promise of benefits, I think we agree that's prohibited by the Act, and it's not protected by Section 8C. And, and by the way, the, the National Labor Relations Act contains a significant number of provisions that explicitly protect employees from unlawful employer discrimination or retaliation or interference or restraint or coercion regarding union-related issues. So we agree that protection exists in the statute with respect to those things that are prohibited in the list that I just mentioned. Um, but the NLRB General Counsel contends that an employer's workplace discussions that say anything about a union or anything about the exercise of protected rights, they are per se unlawful when the discussions do not contain any coercive threat or improper promise. That contention does exactly what Section 8C prohibits. Under Section 8C, if an expression contains no improper threat or promise, the statute says, again, quote, it shall not constitute or be evidence of any violation under, quote, any of the provisions of this act. Now, here's my second point. I don't think meetings and discussions can be deemed inherently unlawful by calling them mandatory. The concept of employment involves choice on both sides, and uh, employees choose to work, and they're paid for their working time. Uh, that's a voluntary relationship, and no surprise, the place and time when employers have the opportunity to engage in discussions with employees is when they're at work. Um, so what the general counsel describes as unlawful mandatory discussions involves nothing more than having employees come to work during which employers and employees engage in all kinds of discussions. Um, and the employees are paid for that time but what's claimed to be inherently unlawful in these discussions is not where they take place or when they take place, 
Instead, these discussions are deemed inherently unlawful when the employer is the speaker and when the subject matter involves union issues or some other exercise of NLRA rights. And that's the type of content-based restriction that under long established First Amendment law is unconstitutional under the First Amendment. My third point is this, and I don't mean to offend the textualists in the audience um, who believe every inquiry starts and ends with statutory language, but you know, if the language in Section 8C is not considered dispositive, then most lawyers would ask, at least some lawyers would ask, even some judges, is there any relevant legislative history? And, you know, Craig described some of the NLRA's legislative history relating to NLRA Section 8C, and I'll just say that um, there's a lot of legislative history which I think, in fact, is dispositive of these issues, and I view the legislative history quite a bit differently than Craig. Um, but in 1946, it's true, the NLRB decided the case. The name of this case was Clark Brothers. Um, and in that case, the NLRB held that an employer's, quote, superior economic power and, quote, its ability to control employee actions during working hours meant that any company was inherently, quote, coercing its employees if it forced them to, quote, listen to speeches relating to their organizational activities. Now, in this 1946 case, the board said, when in finding that these discussions were inherently unlawful, uh, the board said that the, quote, employees were compelled to assemble during working time to listen to anti-union campaign speeches, and the NLRB embraced exactly the same restrictions on employer speech for the same reasons that are now being articulated again by NLRB General Counsel Abruzzo and, and supported by Craig and, and others. Now the very next year, this Clark Brothers case was decided in 1946, the very next year in 1947, the year after Clark Brothers was decided, Congress amended the National Labor Relations Act by adding Section 8C. And the House and Senate reports and debates clearly indicate that Section 8C was added to restore employer First Amendment rights that the NLRB had tried to take away in Clark Brothers and other cases. In fact, in 1947, when the Taft-Hartley amendments added Section 8C to the Act, uh, the House Democrats opposed the Taft-Hartley amendments. And you know, the original Wagner Act, the NLRA that was adopted in 1935, didn't even have union unfair labor practices. It only had violations by employers. One of the things that the Taft-Hartley Act added in 1947, apart from Section 8C, was a number of enumerated union unfair labor practices as well. So in 1947, when the Taft-Hartley Act was being considered, the House Democrats opposed the amendments except they supported the amendment protecting employer speech because, quote, and this was in the minority report in the House, the First Amendment protects an employer's expressions of non-coercive opinion to his employees respecting union organization. Now, in 1947, John F. Kennedy was a freshman House member, and he authored his own separate uh, minority report, and in his report, he also expressed support for the restoration of employer free speech rights that the NLRB had tried to take away. Um, and in his minority, minority report, he stated, quote, the First Amendment protects an employer's expressions of non-coercive opinion to his employees respecting union organization. And where do you think those expressions that the Democrats in the House believe should be protected, where do you think those expressions took place? They took place in the workplace, and they took place in the workplace during paid time. Um, the 
Uh, it's true that the NLRB in the 1948 case called Babcock and Wilcox interpreted Section 8D, I think correctly, as repudiating this entire captive audience theory of violation. But the board is not the only uh, agency or the only adjudicator that had this view. Courts of Appeals also state it is clear that Section 8C repudiated the captive audience theory of illegality. In 1969, the Supreme Court decided the Gissel Packing case and the court said that, quote, an employer's free speech right to communicate his views to his employees is firmly established and cannot be infringed by a union or the board. And in 2008, the Supreme Court in Chamber of Commerce versus Brown said that Section 8C, quote, implemented the First Amendment in that it responded to particular constitutional rulings of the NLRB. And the Supreme Court in the same case said that the NLRA reflected a, quote, policy judgment favoring uninhibited, robust, and wide open debate in labor disputes. And the Supreme Court said that freewheeling use of the written and spoken word has been expressly fostered by Congress and approved by the NLRB. So if the NLRA makes it inherently unlawful for employers in the workplace to have discussions about union issues or the exercise of protected rights, that news has not made its way to the Supreme Court or the Courts of Appeals. And for my fourth and final point, it, it is worth talking about policy considerations in this area. Now, I've worked in a large number of workplaces um, in my life. Uh, I started working at age 14 as a caddy um, I worked as a movie theater usher. I worked in a public library. I worked as a uh, musical director and show pianist um, and was represented by Local 6471 of the American Federation of Musicians. Um, and I've been exposed to thousands of workplaces in the course of my career in private practice in my years on the NLRB. An inherent part of every job is for employees and employers to have all kinds of workplace discussions. All kinds. Some discussions involve safety. Some involve important product quality or customer service issues. And other discussions may involve union issues or other NLRA protected rights. And by the way, employers in workplace discussions may affirmatively state the company respects the rights of employees to make their own decisions about union issues, or the company is committed to avoiding any unlawful inference, interference with NLRA protected rights. And the one other thing about policy is, uh, I'll say one more thing, the speech restrictions that are advocated by the NLRB general counsel and supported by Craig and others I find especially troubling and disappointing when they are viewed in conjunction with other NLRB decisions that recently have diminished the role played by NLRB elections and the manner in which NLRB elections occur. On August 25th, the NLRB decided a case called Semex Construction, and Semex indicates that the board will issue orders imposing union recognition on many more employers and employees in many more cases without any employee voting in NLRB conducted secret ballot elections. Separately, on August 25th, the NLRB published new election procedures that will greatly accelerate the timetable for conducting elections. And in fact, to make sure that elections occur at the earliest date practicable these new procedures, which will take effect at the end of the year, um, provide that in most cases, elections will take place first, and only after the election will the board determine who is eligible to vote in the election. No joke, the election goes first, and afterwards the board will determine who are eligible 
voters in the great majority of cases. So now, in the fewer number of cases where employees will even have the opportunity to vote in an NLRB secret ballot election, the NLRB general counsel seeks to extinguish the right of employers to say anything positive or negative when the subject matter in workplace discussions involves anything about a union. Now, I don't think that can be reconciled with what the Supreme Court said in Chamber of Commerce versus Brown when they talked about the policy judgment that Congress placed in the NLRA, which was to have uninhibited, robust, and wide open debate in labor disputes, including the, quote, freewheeling use of the written and spoken word. So I'll stop there. I'll say again, it's really a pleasure to be here um, at the Federalist Society meeting and to be on this panel with Craig and also Judge Radler. That was great. Thank you to both of you. If your bingo card had Phil arguing legislative history and Craig arguing the Florida governor, then you win. Uh, <laughs> but I doubt that was on anyone's card. So you've both teed up some pretty interesting legal issues. So it seems like we have a statutory question of how to interpret the NLRA, what prohibitions that places on the employer. And then we have the First Amendment overlay. And we had both acknowledgement of the employer's speech rights under the First Amendment and then maybe uh, some rights of the employees to not be forced to hear certain kinds of speech. And maybe there's some constitutional avoidance doctrines that we should be thinking about. So if you're a judge, how do you sort of hash out all these legal arguments? Um, what's the right way to sort of look at the statute against the First Amendment backdrop? And either of you can go first. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I think that question really uh, poses some questions about what Phil just said, because I think it's very important how we describe what the general counsel is arguing for. Uh, Phil called them, Phil called it, quote, speech restrictions, quote, speech restrictions in the workplace. But in fact, there are no speech restrictions at issue here. Uh, the general counsel is not arguing that the employer can't speak any time, any place on the subject of the union and how employees should vote in a union election. All the general counsel is arguing is that the employer cannot discipline people who refuse to speak. There is no restriction on speech. That's exactly what the governor is arguing. Um, so I think if you're, uh, if you're a, a judge, you have to be very careful to look at exactly what's being argued for. Uh, the employer will still have vast advantages in speaking on this topic. Uh, my, my old law professor, Jack Getman, many years ago, don't know how many decades ago, wrote, wrote, did a study of NLRB elections. It's very controversial in a number of respects. But one of the most important findings of this study was that employers are able to reach a key group that a union can't. And that key group is the undecided. Right? That is, before a union election, uh, employers have everybody in the workplace. Employers can walk throughout the workplace. Employers can talk to people, bring in their consultants. They keep the union agents outside the workplace. They have vast advantages in reaching everybody. The union can only reach the willing listeners. So this study found that the undecided, that critical segment, are reached by the employer and not by the union. So there's not going to be any restriction on employer speech. There will be a robust debate. What won't happen is there will be coerced listening and employees either threatened with or actually disciplined for not listening. So I'm not concerned about the First Amendment argument or the 8C argument, because if you clearly define what's at issue, there is no free speech issue, either under the statute or under the Constitution. Yeah, and I would say that I think Judge Radler, with respect to the question that you asked, what's a judge to do in looking at this, I think the first place that a judge would look um, like other lawyers is the text of the statute. And it's also possible that uh, to the extent that the statute is not considered to be dispositive, um, again, no offense to the textualists, te textualists here, um, legislative history is uh, also worth looking at for guidance. And I think with respect to the issues that we're talking about here, I think that they're consistent both in terms of the the 
protection that the statute affords to these types of discussions, including meetings that take place on paid time. And notwithstanding the distinctions that Craig tried, uh, suggested exist, where the general counsel is just suggesting it's the mandatory nature of the meetings that makes them unlawful, that is precisely the same theory that the board embraced in 1946. And it's precisely the same thing that Congress repudiated in 1947. And to the extent that employers or other parties engage in protected speech that they have a right to engage in, then I think the predicate uh, of the general counsel's current view, which is various requirements and additional rights can be imposed as a penalty for exercising that right to engage in protected speech. I think that uh, those uh, penalties or restrictions that encumber protected speech are themselves violative of the First Amendment. Uh, let me then pose this question to you, Phil. Uh, I think some of the policy uh, considerations underlying the LRB's interpretation would, would try to reflect the power dynamic here between uh, oftentimes a very sophisticated employer and individual employees who might not be as deemed sophisticated. I said a case involving Starbucks, it could be other employers, but you can have very sophisticated employers who are delivering a message to a captured or captive audience uh, and uh, that audience may feel compelled to follow the instruction of the employer, or at least the strong advice of the employer, and they may have economic reasons that they feel like require them to do so. I assume those are some of the policy considerations. Craig can probably give us more, but what's your response to that? And Craig, we'll let you follow up. Well, the one thing I'll say is without question, employees have important rights under the National Labor Relations Act, and they're rights that warrant protection and need to be protected. Um, but that's why we have a legislature. And so Congress, in the National Labor Relations Act, protected the rights of employees in various ways. Congress protected the rights of employers in certain ways. And Congress protected the rights of unions and also put a significant variety of obligations on employers and unions, too. Um, so the National Labor Relations Act reflects various types of protection that, um, and choices that were made by Congress, taking into account all of the considerations, Judge Radler, that you just mentioned. Uh, the need for protection, the fact that employees may be economically dependent on uh, their employer. But as I said before, the essence of every employment relationship is, um, uh, is voluntary. Um, virtually every state still recognizes in some way employment at will. Um, and the the NLRB's job is to call balls and strikes in an even-handed manner. And before the NLRB, every party is entitled to the protection that the NLRA affords. And I think that it gets things in reverse to suggest that the NLRB should skew its jobs in trying to referee these important labor management issues and employment-related issues by suggesting that one party should be afforded special protection by the, NLR, by the NLRB if that, even if that diverges from what is reflected in the statute itself. The fundamental, fundamental part of the statute is that you, you can't say this is a voluntary relationship if you don't like it, go elsewhere. By that argument, it would be fine to say, uh, I'm gonna fire you if, you if you sign a union card. That's illegal, and nobody argues that that's not illegal. Now, the, the notion that employees are particularly vulnerable to strong expressions of view by their employer, that's undoubtedly true, but we have a First Amendment, and the Supreme Court has made clear, and Section 8C makes clear, that that's not unlawful. Even if that, we might think that's undue influence, the employer has no, as, as the board said, Prior to 47, the employer has no business, not only has no business trying to influence who sits on the other side of the table, but it's coercive for them to do so. That argument is clearly no longer possible. But a clear threat or discipline for protected activity, which is listening or not listening, do you think I could defend that it doesn't violate the act 
if a union agent goes out and says, if I don't see you at tonight's union meeting, I'm going to break your arm? Am I going to be able to argue that the threat is not contained in the speech, that I can divide those two, as Phil has attempted to do under 8C, that the, the speech does not contain the threat because there's a period between the statement, if I don't see you at tonight's meeting, period, I'm going to break your leg? There's a threat. Unquestionably, there's a threat implicit in a captive audience meeting. It's not, it's not the implicit threat, it's an explicit threat. And when you tie that together with the, with the strong urging of an opinion, come to this meeting, I'm going to urge you strongly to vote no in the upcoming election, and then if someone stands up to, at the meeting and says, I I've heard both sides, I know what I want to do, I want to leave, and the employer says, if you leave, you'll be terminated. So tying the economic power and that threat directly to the message contemporaneously, obviously that's what the act is intended to prohibit. And HC allows uh, the board to prohibit. And uh, Judge Radler, if I could just yeah, add one thing. Um, you know, it's important to note that the NLRB general counsel's views, they're not limited to meetings, and they're not limited to meetings that are characterized as mandatory. Uh, so the general counsel's memo that deals with these issues that was issued in April of last year explicitly stated that what the general counsel believes would be inherently unlawful or uh, per se unlawful and inherently coercive are either meetings that deal with either union issues or the exercise of protected rights. Um, not just meetings, but also one-on-one -on -one discussions between an employer and even individual employees that occur on paid time. So, number one, it, these restrictions are not limited to meetings. And number two, um, the general counsel has made very clear in the briefs that have been filed in several cases, one involving Semex and another involving Starbucks, um, that uh, the meetings don't have to be characterized as mandatory. The meetings and these discussions will be presumed to be mandatory, resulting in an implicit threat of discipline, um, unless every one of these discussions dealing with union issues or the, protected, uh, the exercise of NLRA protected rights is preceded by a catalog of different disclaimers that the employer has to present that resemble Miranda rights, which have to be uh, given to criminal suspects by law enforcement authorities before their people are placed under custodial interrogation. Um, except the assurances that the general counsel would require are longer than Miranda rights. And Craig was nice enough to make reference to the written version of my uh, congressional testimony. And I um, quoted the assurances that the general counsel has indicated must precede any of these protected discussions and also Miranda rights, and the Miranda rights are actually considerably shorter. But, uh, you know, these are very, very broad uh, prohibitions. And it's not just, uh, they don't just relate to meetings, and they don't just relate to meetings or discussions that have been described as mandatory. It's a much more broad-based prohibition than that. Anybody else? Sir? Yeah. Okay, so uh, Craig, let me pose a question to you that the Foundation is stare decisis. Uh, so this is this for a 75 year period, I think the board had an unbroken practice of allowing employers to hold these types of meetings and convey this type of information. And that is now, at least from advice of the general counsel that has changed. Uh, if you think of Dobbs, you know, Roe was a 50 year old decision where there were lots of arguments about reliance interests. Here we have 75 years. And uh, did something change in the meantime that required the uh, general counsel to revisit this issue or, or you know, if, if a court's looking at this, why shouldn't they take into consideration that agencies change their mind quite, a, quite often, when, especially when administrations change, and this, this position had not changed over many, many administrations? I mean, I think that's a very good question, and I think probably that's the most powerful counter-argument, that the doctrine has existed for a long time. Uh, what's the reason for changing it now? And I think uh, the answer, I, I would say, is a fewfold. Uh, one, um, I think the, the doctrine that permits captive audience meetings is so fundamentally contrary uh, 
uh, to the central purpose of the act, which is to prevent economic coercion. Um, and I think if you, if you were to go and talk to people on the street, non-lawyers, and you would say, is it fair in a political election or a union election for employer to force employees uh, to listen to their position on pain of an economic sanction, uh, I think you'd have a large vote against uh, that being lawful. So I, I think it's just fundamentally inconsistent with the statute and common, common notions of fairness. Um, I think there is, the reason why it's come more to the fore recently is much greater use of captive audience meetings by employers. I think, uh, like everything else in our society, uh, union, the question of unions has become more polarized. Employers have run more vigorous campaigns in the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, there's been a number of studies which talk about the prevalence of the use of captive audiences. Something upwards of 80% of employers use multiple captive audiences uh, before elections. Uh, I think at Amazon, uh, the warehouse on Staten Island, employees were subject to uh, countless captive audience meetings. Uh, so I think there has been a change in practice. But I think most fundamentally, uh, uh, this is simply wrong. Uh, wrong under the statute. Uh, and wrong as a matter of common sense. Um, I would just add uh, to the one point that Craig made. I don't go all the way back to 1935 when the National Labor Relations Act um, was adopted, but I go back at least to the 1950s. And I grew up in Pittsburgh, western Pennsylvania. When I was born, Pittsburgh was still, there were steel mills all over town. Uh, the local paper in Pittsburgh didn't just have a business section, it had a business and labor section. And of course, the United Steelworkers has its headquarters, had and still has their headquarters in Pittsburgh. But the notion that suddenly employers are resorting to workplace discussions, or as Craig calls them, captive audience speeches, more now than took place in the 30s after the National Labor Relations Act was first adopted, or in the 1940s when there was a proliferation of strikes after World War II. Uh, you know, the, the act was adopted in the mid-30s during the New Deal. And if you don't believe that employers at that time had strong feelings about this new statute, uh, you're wrong. Um, and, you know, the reason why there are so many protections for employees in the statute deals with all of the tactics and strategies that employers back then employed, um, you know, that had a very deleterious effect on employee rights and union rights. Uh, but I don't think one of the reasons for suddenly this um, doctrine, which the board had embraced in 1946 and which Congress, Congress repudiated in 1947, you know, I don't think that changes in practice in terms of these types of discussions being worse now than they were back then, I, I don't think that that really survives serious scrutiny. Um, and um, I also think that um, it's not possible to think that the Supreme Court and the Courts of Appeals and the Board have all been wrong every day for the past 70 years. I just don't think that that's reasonable either. So we're fortunate to have two you know, leading experts on labor law and two former members of the NLRB. So maybe ask if we ex zoom out a little bit, um, is this rule change or a change in approach reflective of, of a broader um, uh, agenda at the board itself or in the Biden administration? Are there other lessons to draw here? Are there other issues that we should be thinking about as we try to sort of look at the full, full picture? Great. Um, well, I do think that, um, appropriately, the position of the general counsel on this and other issues does reflect the Biden administration's general, uh, general position on labor. Um, not that the uh, Biden administration is giving directions to the general counsel, uh, but you all know probably that for the first time in history, Biden, uh, President Biden removed the prior general counsel, you know, consistent with unitary executive theory and decisions about the president's authority control the executive branch generally. Uh, the general counsel is not protected by just cause provision in the statute, unlike the board members. Um, and uh, President Biden exercises authority to remove the prior general counsel and appoint a new one. So I think it's consistent 
generally with the administration's position, uh, obviously not directed on these specific issues. Uh, I think the general, it's also consistent with, and, and this goes to Phil's very uh, accurate statement that the general counsel has taken a very broad uh, position, perhaps broader than what I've described. Uh, another thing that's been, I think, quite unique about uh, General Counsel Bruzo is how open she's been in the theories that she is either propounding or even going to propound. That is, she's announced long in advance, sometimes through uh, formal memos, sometimes through social media, uh, what she's going to argue. And I once asked her, like, what's the theory about doing that? And, and she was very frank in saying, I'm trying, to, you know, I'm trying to create a discussion. I'm trying to get people to think, including the board members, uh, before they have to decide these issues. So the fact that she's propounded a very broad theory, uh, I think, is intended to provoke a discussion about what the statute says and what's the best policy, not necessarily to uh, accomplish everything that's set forth in her argument. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that, that in both of those ways, it's consistent with overall administration policy appropriately. Uh, and then in process, I think it's consistent with her, uh, her approach. And I said before, uh, and I'll repeat this, uh, that I have respect for the general counsel of Bruzo, uh, who was, among other things, the deputy general counsel during almost my entire four and a half years on the board when I, when I served. And I totally agree with Craig that she has been very open with the theories that she has been advocating. And the general counsel, as most of you know, functions like the NLRB's uh, very important prosecuting attorney. And she has embraced that role with a vengeance. Um, uh, and it is also true that uh, President Biden has described his administration as the most pro-union administration in, in history. And, um, uh, you know, I think that's probably true, too. And uh, as uh, Craig alluded to this, but, you know, he, the former general counsel, uh, Peter Robb, received an email literally 23 minutes after uh, President Biden was sworn in, indicating that he was going to be removed that day if he didn't resign, even though roughly 10 months remain in Peter Robb's term as general counsel. Um, and in fact, he declined the opportunity to resign uh, and he was removed that, that very day. Um, and you know, that particular issue in the president's, uh, whether the president has the right to remove, um, uh, to remove the general counsel uh, at will is uh, something that's still the subject of litigation, including one case that I'm, uh, I'm currently uh, handling for a client. So um, that remains unresolved, but uh, I do think that it's worth noting the NLRB is an independent regulatory agency. It's also sometimes called a quasi-adjudicative agency. Um, uh, and there's lots and lots of Supreme Court case law and other case law uh, indicating one case, first national maintenance, the Supreme Court said that the act is intended, uh, is not intended to uh, advance any individual's interest, but it's intended instead to foster in a neutral manner a system in which the conflict between the interests of different parties can be resolved. So it's damaging to the NLRB. It undermines the NLRB's role for the board to be regarded as an extension of any particular administration. And, you know, I think that uh, viewing the board in that light is, it really uh, undermines confidence that parties on all sides, both employees, employers, unions, and the public can have in the board institutionally. And I think that's very damaging, not only to the board, but also to the administration of justice in these cases. Uh, and the board is the only place in the first instance that these cases can be adjudicated. Great. Well, we'd love to take questions from all of you. I see a microphone uh, here in the back. Uh, I have more, more questions, but um, we'll go ahead and start with the gentleman who's up at the, at the mic now. All right. Um, uh, maybe, maybe, say who, maybe say who you are, which would be great. Uh, I'm Pepper Crutcher. I'm the guy who yes. introduced you. <laughs> okay. I knew that, but just for the general. Okay. Uh, flip side of the coin, um, Mr. Miscamara, if 
um, your analysis correct, how do you continue to justify the peerless plywood rule, if you do, um, for Mr. Becker? If your analysis is correct, how do you continue to justify, if you do, the uh, union demands regularly conceded by employers that new hires be required on work time to listen to union membership uh, solicitations made by union representatives? But I think in terms of peerless uh, plywood you're referring to, the board has had a, a long-standing practice in representation case that bars captive audience speeches during the 24 hours preceding uh, any election. And a couple of things. One is um, that, that doctrine, which has uh, been around for a long time, it relates to the board's conduct of elections. It doesn't find that those discussions would end up being unfair labor practices under the act, violations of the act. It would just be found to be objectionable conduct for purposes of overturning an election. And, and that is uniquely within the board's authority to monitor. And the board has also, um, for many, many years, regulated various types of election-related conduct as it pertains to elections. But the, um, uh, but the protection that's afforded by Section 8C relates to alleged unfair labor practices, and it's explicit on that. It says, the expressions of views, argument, or opinion shall not constitute or be evidence of an unfair labor practice under any of the provisions of this act. And that's the most important distinction between the two. Um, can I take the liberty of answering both questions? I mean, <laughs> the, Extra credit uh, you know, the distinction between representation proceedings and objections and unfair labor practices is obviously important, both for the reason Phil just mentioned, which is that uh, this fee the free speech proviso is expressly limited to unfair labor practices, and also because several courts have held uh, that overturning an election is not a sanction which implicates the First Amendment. So in the context of unions, for example, filing lawsuits on behalf of employees on the eve of an election, that's protected petitioning activity. And yet several courts, the D.C. Circuit and the Fourth Circuit, have said it's still a grant of benefits and you can overturn an election on that basis. So you know, this argument is even stronger that, that uh, captive audience meetings should be objectionable than the argument the general counsel is making, which is that they should be unlawful. Um, the question about uh, 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 meetings to, uh, to inform empl employees in a newly organized workplace about the union uh, and joining the union is a good one, and I actually haven't thought about it uh, before, so I appreciate the question. I do think it's different in the sense that uh, you have a balance. The, um, the, uh, the employer is not holding the meeting to express its own views, uh, but rather is acceding to a request by the union to be able to speak to uh, employees about joining the union and the other benefits of uh, being union members. So I don't think it involves the same type of threat, um, but it is a good question. I'd like to think about it some more. Okay, we'll go to this side. Thank you. Um, Tammy McCutcheon, um, most people think of me as a wage and hour girl, but in the wee dawn of time, I actually was among the associates representing Overnight Transportation Company in the um, Teamster corporate campaign. And at that time, I actually litigated, we lost, of course, um, First Amendment. We had um, the Fourth Circuit and the board said a button that said, give Jim a chance, Jim being a new CEO, was an unlawful promise and a wheel of misfortune, which helped employees determine how much money they would lose if they went on strike, was an unlawful threat. So I'd like you guys to back up a little bit and help us understand what is a threat, what is a promise, and how does the First Amendment restrict findings that truthful, factual statement like the wheel of misfortune could actually be um, be a ULP, can be a violation. And also one more, what if instead of a mandatory meeting, I promised every employee who attended a $50 gift certificate to the Texas Roadhouse? <laughs> um, I'll take the threat question, um, Tammy, and you know what Section 8C makes explicit reference to are uh, threats of reprisal or force. 
uh, as not being within the protection uh, of the statute. Uh, otherwise, the board does interpret the threat in a variety of different ways, and it's true that threats, if there are threats, they can be um, explicit or they can be implied. Uh, but, you know, this was the specific focus of Congress in 1947 when Congress amended the Act. And what Section 8C is quite explicit about is the expression of views, arguments, or opinion will not be considered unlawful, period, unless the expression itself contains a threat of reprisal or force. Um, I'm not going to go into the details, but there's also a very important Supreme Court case that was decided uh, called Counterman uh, a short while ago. And the Counterman case deals with a threat of violence. And the Supreme Court held that the First Amendment requires, even in connection with a criminal matter involving a threat of violence, there has to be some consideration of the speaker's subjective intent before, because of the First Amendment protection that speakers have. Um, so even in a threat of violence case, the Supreme Court in the Counterman case, it's uh, C-O-U-N-T-E-R-M-A-N, in the Counterman decision, uh, really uh, introduces, uh, I think, some uh, significantly greater protection for speakers from a First Amendment perspective than previously existed. Um, that is a really good question. You know, um, Justice Breyer in his dissent in Sorrell, um, you know, said the First Amendment as understood by today's Supreme Court is essentially a radical deregulatory tool because all regulation involves precisely the kind of hard questions you're asking. It's a threat if based on its subject matter. That is, you say the same thing about joining a union, but say the same thing not about joining a union, and it doesn't violate the NLRA, subject matter discrimination. And it's true of many, many statutes. You know, I would add to your list of problems. Uh, I ask my president, uh, Liz Schuler to take a picket sign and walk back and forth peacefully in front of the door of this hotel with a sign that says don't enter because the Mayflower is using a cleaning contractor which pays substandard wages per se unlawful under the statute. How is that possible? Uh, so you know there's many under this statute and many others there is regulation of speech and a very difficult line drawing. You know, that's what Gissel is all about. What is a threat and what is not? And, and there is very, very difficult line drawing uh, to be had. In terms of the last part of your question, there is an argument there too. In fact, Unite HERE has made the argument different from the general counsel that captive, what's unlawful about captive audience meetings is that they always involve uh, a grant of benefits because you're basically allowing people to sit and do nothing and get paid when otherwise they'd have to be working. So. Yeah, maybe a grant of benefits too, but but you know your question just you know raises a, a host of difficult First Amendment problems about this and other regulatory schemes. Okay, over here, Richard Samp with the New Civil Liberties Alliance. Um, first of all, I, this is a subject I knew nothing about before today, so I wanted to thank the panel for a, a very interesting presentation. Um, I was interested in particular with. Craig's discussion of the Florida law that I gather makes it uh, illegal for an employer to coerce employees to listen to woke speech. And it convinced me that that law is unconstitutional. So I guess I wanted to uh, uh, address that issue to Philip, uh, what your view of that Florida law is. And if you don't have a view that you're willing to express, I would be interested in, I, I can't think of any possible constitutional justification for the law what would be the best possible argument that you would make for Governor DeSantis if you were trying to defend it? Um, well, you know, it's interesting. The one thing that um, my mother always taught me, uh, and this was even before I went to law school, is don't opine about a law that you have not read mm. and don't give <laughs> advice to a client that you don't represent. So um, I think I'm going to withhold judgment because I literally have not spent 
not even a minute, probably not even five seconds focusing on, on that law, and I'm not in a position, I think, to give an informed answer to those questions. But these are, these are excellent questions, so we'll continue on this side. Uh, Jim Young, National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. I was a uh, fascinating presentation. Thank both speakers. Uh, I was interested in the things I didn't hear about. I heard very little about employee rights, and as Justice Thomas wrote in Leachmere, uh, a lot of these many years ago, the act protects employee rights, not union rights, not employer rights, but primarily employee rights. So I don't know how you make people listen. They can be present, but they can't be forced to listen. And I also didn't hear any mention of Excelsior lists, which give union organizers the tool to appear on the front porches or at the front stoops of employees during an organizing campaign and during the critical period leading up to an election. Aren't those employees also forced to listen and do we also have to cast aside Excelsior? Uh, the, uh, and, and are there, is everybody here a labor lawyer? I don't think so. If you're not a labor lawyer, raise your hand. Okay, there are quite, Excelsior list is the employer, empl the employee list. Names, addresses, if they maintain them, uh, email addresses, telephone numbers, and they're given to all the parties to an election. I didn't hear any mention of those, uh, you know, the instrumentality to force people to listen. Could the speakers uh, offer any comment on that? Yeah, I'll just mention one or two things in terms of employee rights. Um, you know, a, a, an important part of speech in relation to workplace discussions is so that employees are exposed to what an employer thinks or guidance that an employer can give. Uh, and certainly in an organizing drive, employees are exposed to the union's views, and it's also important for employer, employees to be exposed, I think, to employers' views. Uh, you know, whether employees choose to exercise their right to have union representation or whether they choose not to, those are important issues regardless of how that turns out, and they're important implications for the workplace, they're important implications for the company, they're important rights, but also important obligations that relate to employees. And you, one of the interesting things about a different aspect of legislative history, I mentioned that when the Taft-Hartley Act was uh, amended in 1947, John F. Kennedy was a freshman House member. Well, by 1959, he was a uh, senator, and he chaired the conference committee that considered the 1959 Landrum-Griffin Act amendments to the act, and he advocated that there be enough time in every election, at least 30 days, so that employees would not be rushed into making a decision too fast when they were unfamiliar with the relevant uh, issues. So I think employee rights are very much implicated in these workplace discussion restrictions because um, as the Supreme Court has indicated in a number of different cases, uh, including the Chamber of Commerce case, uh, you know, the NLRA contemplated um, robust discussion about these issues, and I think that part of the reason for that under the Act is so that employees can get the perspective, uh, multiple perspectives, not only from the union but from employers as well. Yeah, I, I frankly don't understand the question. This has nothing to do with the union rights. The whole discussion is about employee rights, employee rights uh, after 1947 to support uh, or to refrain from supporting, to listen or to refrain from, from listening. So this is all about employee rights. In terms of the Excelsior list, it's an accepted practice, I believe, in every state uh, in, in, in elections for public office that the voter rolls are open. Uh, you, can, you can go and, and get a list and find everybody who voted in the last election and their address. Uh, and many of us find it annoying uh, when those people call us up and tell us to vote and vote for a particular person or knock on the door or leave a flyer, but I don't think any of us find it coercive uh, that that goes on. Uh, no one's being forced to listen. No one's being forced to take that flyer. I mean, the analogy would be if the representative came to the door and the person said, I don't want to talk to you, and they said, if you don't talk to me, I'll break your arm. That's the analogy. If you don't come to the meeting, you'll be fired. It's all about employee rights. Did you, I saw you standing, I saw you just sit down. To, uh, I didn't to, want to get in the way of lunch, but I just I had I a think, quick I think we may, question. May, yeah, sure. Um, 
Abruzzo's memo, is there any concern about the chilling effects of Abruzzo's sort of campaign to overturn the NLRB's decision, not only through one case litigation, but also through multiple cases and her memo? Well, I'll, I'll say, you know, I expressed the view before that I think the prosecution of these cases, um, not just the claims in those cases infringe on First Amendment rights. I think that the NLRB's prosecution of these cases um, also in, infringes on First Amendment rights because at least these cases, when they're being prosecuted, um, produce a chilling effect on all employers with respect to any speech that they engage in or workplace discussions that they choose to engage in. And if they are lawful, then the threat of prosecution is a very significant thing, especially for employers who are involved in some of these cases because, as everyone knows, an, an NLRB unfair labor practice case often takes three to five years or more from start to finish, and sometimes court litigation makes those cases last for five to ten years. Um, the one other thing that's very important in the Supreme Court counterman case that I made reference to is the Supreme Court expressed great concern about the chilling effect of restrictions on employer speech, excuse me, restrictions on a speaker's speech even in criminal cases involving threats of violence, and the Supreme Court expressed a concern about the chilling effect on the speaker. In these employer NLRB cases, the speaker is the employer. The Supreme Court didn't express concern about the chilling effect on the recipient of the uh, whatever is alleged to be a threat. It's a chilling effect. The Supreme Court was concerned about the impact on the speaker. and. Uh, I think that that, um, that gives rise to significant concerns about possible infringement that results just from the prosecution of these types of cases or an indication that these types of discussions will result in prosecution. I mean, the stare decisis, the, the chilling effect is in some sense the answer to the stare decisis uh, question. That is, the general counsel has given notice, very public, as we both uh, described, that I'm gonna advance this theory, I now am advancing this theory. So in terms of reliance interests, those are being lessened by that very public advocacy. Uh, in terms of chilling effect, uh, I'm not concerned about chilling coercion. I'd be concerned about chilling speech, but I'm not concerned about chilling coercion. And what's gonna be the sanction? If there's no coercion, if, if this is really willing listening, and somehow it's still held to be unlawful, the sanction would be a notice posting in a cease and desist order. The only meaningful sanction is gonna be if someone is fired. So unless there's economic retaliation, there's not gonna be a meaningful sanction, even if speech is at issue, which I don't think it is. Okay, we have time for two very quick questions, so we'll start, we'll start here. All right, uh, Dan McLaughlin from National Review. I, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I have a big picture question. I'll set the context for just a moment, but I promise there is a short question at the end of it. Um, <laughs> okay. I, 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 I covered the, the ALJ and, and board decisions that were ultimately overturned by the Third Circuit in the, uh, the Federalist case uh, involving a, uh, a joke tweet being treated as an unfair labor practice. Um, and it seemed to me, at least as you know, a veteran litigator, but from outside of labor law, that if you read things like Gissel Packing and then you looked at how they were actually applied by the board and the ALJ, that, that fundamental concepts like reasonable listener and the relevance of evidence were just being applied in radically different ways than you would find almost anywhere else in the law. Um, so I guess my, my question is, I on a big picture level, is, is the board and the agency a little too siloed from how law works in like every other area of practice? Well, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, you know, and the, the board has a range of cases. Uh, the biggest one involves cases where uh, for many years the board provided for special protection that would be afforded to sexually or racially offensive statements and actions, even if uh, those offensive sta statements and actions would uh, uniformly result in discipline or discharge uh, and consistent with anti-harassment policies that are required um, uh, 
in Title VII cases and EEOC regulations. And uh, the board recently in a case called uh, uh, Lioness Elastomers um, reinstated that special protection afforded to sexually or racially offensive conduct. And, and there are a number of other cases where the board really focuses more on its statute to the exclusion of other statutes. And um, I think that's been an issue with the board uh, generally, and it's an issue with the board at the present time. Um, believe it or not, I actually agree with that a little bit. Um, I, I think that um, I'd much rather the board prohibit actual coercion than try to draw the impossible line that you're describing and that Tammy described. Uh, between, you know, is this core just slightly over the line? Is it not over the line? Um, you know, he, and, and going back to the, to the Getman study I described earlier, very controversially, he found that most of what the board prohibits has no effect on employees. Even, you know, promise of benefit, what the board might consider be a threat, uh, but what really matters is being forced to listen, and that is clearly coercion. So, so I, I really think that it might make sense for the board to stick to what's really coercion uh, and shy slightly away from the kind of cases you're describing. Thanks. Well, I um, am tempted to end on a point of agreement, <laughs> so I apologize. Uh, we, I think we're about out of time, but I'm sure our panelists will stay around for any final questions. Uh, but many of us raised our hand as non-labor lawyers. This was incredibly informative. Even for those of you who are labor lawyers, I suspect you learned a lot. So please join me in thanking the panel. And enjoy lunch. <laughs>